Hi, this is Janos, it's Real World Audio, and we are talking about the Darling Amplifier, and I'm following up on Rick's and Jürgen's comments about the schematics, and uh, Rick was asking why did I deviate from Bob's original schematic uh, for the operating points, did it sound aggressive for me with the higher currents, and uh, let's just get into the have a little look at uh, the original schematics, Bob Daniel Alex original darling, and there it shows one channel and shows the other channel, and both of them here, the cathode resistor on the driver tube was 200 ohms, which is equivalent to 400 ohms each. So, well, this might sound a little bit confusing, but what's happening here is that uh, uh, Bob did something very unusual here, uh, and I, I would say it's unusual because uh, uh, this was not usually done in the driver stages. So, so when you look at vintage amplifiers, especially in the budget category, you may see sometimes that the left and right channel output stages share a common cathode resistor instead of each of them having their own resistors. And that uh, in, in vintage designs, when you see that happening, it was a way of saving on cost because you needed only one resistor instead of two. And, uh, and also a little bit easier to construct one part less to solder. So, uh, companies in their budget or entry-level models used to do that. And what that does to the sound, it makes the sound stage a little bit closer to mono, because the two tubes are connected together through their cathodes, so whatever change happens to one tube, it affects the other. So that means whatever happens in the left channel, it's going to have an impact on the right channel as well. And of course that impact is going to be mitigated by the bypass capacitor over there, but it's still uh, not, uh, you are going to hear it in the sound that the sound stage is, is uh, narrower compared to having uh, uh, cathode uh, resistors dedicated for each channel. So typically for uh, uh, vintage amplifiers you saw this happen in the power stage. But what Bob did here with his Darling Amp, he also did that trick with the input stage as well, because uh, uh, he made this uh, Darling Amplifier as an exercise on how to build a tube amplifier with the least possible number of parts. So this is an extra exercise on ultimate simplicity, on how to build <laughs> an amplifier with really the least number of parts. And to everyone's surprise, uh, it, that did not just work, but it worked spectacularly well. But as, as, as the story, if you read the paper, I will put the link to it, describes he did not just um, stumble into this uh, by mistake, he really did try out this type of layout, but he tried out different tubes for the driver. I think he tried out about a dozen tubes or so, until he found the combination of this driver tube and that power tube that really created that extraordinary sound that the Darling amps are famous for. And then of course people were building them with different tubes, and usually if it's just the power tube is the same 1626, then people are calling them darlings, or if, if, if the driver tube is the same but you put something similar, uh, that, that's a stretch to call it a darling, but if the rest of the schematics is the same, then maybe, maybe, maybe you can call it a darling. So anyway, this was the original Darling, but most of the Darlings that followed after that were a little bit different. And, uh, and 
my darling that I built was a, a modification. That was uh, Jeremy Epstein's darling that uh, that mine was be based upon. And, and let's look at Jeremy's story. He has... Uh, here it is. I think it's it's like it's an archive. So this this page is already archived, and you see last updated in 1999. So this is just from the archives of the internet by Jeremy Epstein. And uh, and first what he did, he was really inspired by by Bob Danielak's Darling. But he thought that, okay, just uh, less than one watt is a little bit a stretch of an imagination. So he, he doubled up the output tubes and, and that's called the double darling because it uses two output tubes uh, for, uh, for the output stage. And, and here, as you see, he used 6SN7 to drive it because uh, it's in the story that he had uh, an old amplifier that he, he, he gutted and he used the parts in there and it had an octal socket so that was perfect for the 6SN7 so that's why he tried first driving his Darling with the 6SN7 and then later on actually he ended up going back to the 8532 which is the military uh, variant, the US military variant of the 6J4, so it's the same tube actually, just different grades of it. And um, so why he did this uh, in this text, you will be able to read that he first thought to make it a push-pull darling. Uh, so that's why he had two 1626s because he was running them in push-pull with an interstage transformer but the, uh, it sounded pretty decent, but when he, he changed it over to parallel single-ended, it sounded much, much better. So that's why he got to this configuration. And then he touched base with Bob Danielak, the original, the, the creator of the Darling circuitry. And then he modified it a little bit further. And then he also uh, mentions that uh, he also talked to Don Garber, uh, who created the legendary Phi uh, amplifier. If you think about the Phi primer, Don Garber, he is truly a legend in, in the single-ended triode history. And, and basically he came up with the uh, double DC darling that we will see down a little bit with the help of Bob Danielak and Don Garber. So first version was going back to the DC darling that used the same driver stage as, uh, as Bob's. Uh, just the difference was using two uh, tubes per channel and instead of the capacitor coupling, he used the direct coupling between the two. And as you see, he did the modification and these modifications, not just by himself, but also talking to Bob Danielak. And they decided to go with the 360 ohm. It says 358, 358 ohms, 360, same thing, basically. It's just 10% less resistance than, uh, than the original Darling. So I would not call it a big deviation. It's, it's really, really tiny uh, if you think about that. And it slightly changes the operation point, but uh, to not even to a degree that, that you might see with the uh, variation between putting in two different driver tubes. So like if you have uh, two different brand driver tubes, the difference between the sound might be bigger than the difference you experience between using 360 ohms on your cathode versus Bob Danielak's 400 ohms. Uh, but when you say, hey, Janos, wait a sec, Bob Danielak said 200 ohms, but yeah, it's for the pair. And when you uh, calculate it for each, that is equivalent to 400 ohms each. So now we have 360 each versus 400 each. 
ne almost negligible difference. So this is running it a little bit like uh, maybe like 15-20% higher current and, and you have a little less uh, voltage dropped through the cathode resistor. So it means that the input voltage uh, the, and the head input headroom is a little bit less compared to the original darlings but you have a lower RP, so when the current is higher, the RP, the plate resistance, drops, so it is more powerful, it can uh, drive the output stage with uh, better ability compared to having a higher uh, resistance there, but, but the difference is just really, really minute, yet I myself never tried the difference between them, it was this uh, schematics, the double DC darling, that my friend and mentor Kyle Kuroda tried out and he built his double DC darling based on Jeremy Epstein double DC darling. And he used uh, this schematic exactly and, uh, and as you see uh, he, uh, Jeremy Epstein also has a power supply for it that he recommends. That's just a, a CLC, just a single Pi filter power supply. But Kyle, what he did is he changed this to a, a double Pi filter power supply. Uh, he dropped a little bit 47 microfarad to 40 microfarad and then 80 80 and instead of a single 1.5 Henry choke it's two times four Henry chokes. Uh, so, so the major difference between or I, them, uh, Jeremy Epstein's and Kyle's was the power supply itself. And then what Kyle did to his is he started experimenting because you see Jeremy's has 1000 microfarad bypass capacitor on the uh, cathode uh, for the uh, output stage and Kyle changed that to much lower to 52 microfarad and, and here he used an electrolytic there and Kyle used uh, polypropylene caps <coughs> and uh, we, we used he used Aerovox capacitor and, and that just tremendously improved the base response and you would think that okay dropping it from 1000 to, to uh, 62 then that's or was it 52? Uh, wh whatever 50-60 microfarad in, in that range uh, my memory is getting foggy a little bit but there is no significant difference between 50 and 60 microfarad there uh, the difference between capacitor brands will impact the sound much more than the difference between 50 or 60 at this point. Mm -hmm. So what he has experienced was that uh, uh, a much higher quality capacitor there with a fraction of the capacitance just tremendously improved the bass response. And uh, it was at that point when we had an audio club meeting at my mentor's place at, at Stu's Audio Directions uh, store at the Algaroba Street and, uh, and after we heard uh, Kyle's Darling Am, I, I was just shocked. I was really, really shocked because uh, it, it, it's, it sounded phenomenally good. And, uh, and then, then I asked, and, it, and we heard it with low efficiency speakers and even with low efficiency speakers that 1.5 watt was loud and excellent bass and it, uh, everyone who heard it was like what or our minds got just got really badly scrambled uh, at that point and uh, oh one more thing that I see here that uh, Jeremy Epstein he was using the Hammond uh, 125E output transformer with 3 kilo ohm uh, load and Kyle he used the 125E SE which was a more modern version of this transformer of this output transformer and with 5k load instead of the 3k load 
So what you get is if you use 5K load instead of 3K, you have less distortion, but a little bit lower power as well. Uh, and, and usually you want to use, if you have a choice, like uh, you want to go for a higher uh, load on the tubes because that will keep them happier and you'll get a cleaner sound. And uh, so anyway, then I asked Kyle if he could bring over his uh, darling to my place and we can hook them up, hook it up to my void pipe because that's uh, much higher efficiency and, um, and sensitivity as well. And, uh, and, and we did that and, and I already had this in my, one of my previous videos that uh, almost everyone who heard his Darling Amp with my void pipes, we all of us decided to build it. And, uh, and uh, for me it was my first time building an amp from scratch and for Tomás it was the first time he did any kind of electronics work at all. He hasn't even built interconnects, nothing. Uh, this was his very first uh, project. And for Charlie, that was also his first amplifier. So the three of us, we just stuck together. Kyle was coaching us and then we used Kyle's uh, mentoring and his schematics basically, uh, which was based on Jeremy Epstein's uh, uh, input and power stage plus Kyle's uh, power supply and um, yeah so that's the story so that's how I was ended up and why I was using the 360 ohm for the uh, driver stage and and that's how we got our operating points and uh, one more modification that Kyle did is here you see it has that 66 kilo ohm load on the input tube. Uh, Kyle also added a 25k pot there so that you could adjust the plate voltage exactly because it's a di direct coupled circuit and based on how strong your tube is it's going to have different plate voltage and with, with, the, with the pot as you adjust, you can dial in exactly uh, the same plate volt, the voltage for both amplifiers. And uh, as you see with the op operating points calculated, the plate voltage for the driver stage should be 127 volts and the cathode voltage for the 1626 should be 154 volts. If you don't have a pot there, it's going to be a little bit different. It's not that uh, you should worry about that much, but with, with the pot you can, you can adjust for it and also adjust for aging of the driver tube. So that's a really nice thing and, and, and really can help you to take better care of this amplifier and, ma and make it last longer. And uh, uh, about, about long lasting of this amplifier, uh, this has been uh, the most stable amplifier I've ever run across in my life and I know and this is a great warning and uh, that direct coupled circuits are really sensitive and uh, in the history of amplifier building it went out of fashion because of the instability this circuit has so when you just try to uh, implemented to random tubes, the end result was unvariably catastrophic and you have to go through extreme means to make it uh, stable. And well, actually it's not extreme uh, those, and well, if you read uh, Frank's comments then uh, he really details them but there is attention needed to be done to make uh, direct coupled circuits uh, uh, stable. However, in the case of the Darling circuit, partially because of the simplicity and also partially because of the extreme reliability of these power tubes, plus what, what you do not see here, what we do see here, 
is that it must use a tube rectifier for the high voltage U, must not, you must never use solid state rectification for DC coupled circuits because you have to wait for the filaments to warm up and then uh, only then you can allow the B plus voltage to rise because if your filaments of the power tube come up first before your filament of the input tube coming up then that will bring forth catastrophic results because the uh, it's not biased yet so if there's no current running through here then here the grid 